All right. So um, we looked at last time that pie charm issue, and I just wanted to make sure everybody knows so that the net, if they're using pie charm uh, like that one assignment. Oh, that's not up, is it? Let me see here. Guys on there we go. So, uh, like I'm, there's an assignment. There's several assignments. I went ahead and put all the dates on the um, on this particular module for next Monday because I, I know I told you I wanted unit three test done today and we are gonna do the mind cap problems in there uh, on the unit three, but I went ahead because um, people may have not seen that change in the date. So you, I won't open it again like I had to for unit two, but you'll see the unit three test says September 23rd. This one, the more on variables, there was quite a few people that didn't turn that in. And I had one student in the online ask me what exercises to do, but I don't know why they didn't see, because did you all have any problem knowing which exercises? Yes, yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. This link? No, the one, the little arrow. Number two. Yeah, right zero. next to number oh, two. Oh, that? Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. And that can be easy when I first started it, but when I seen it was on the other one, I just did those two. Uh, okay. So this link? Wow. That's weird. Okay. I didn't know that was on there. Thank you for explaining that because <laughs> I did click that. So that must be the confusion then. So yeah, these are the two exercises that I wanted you to do for uh, this video. And so those, you only had to do screenshots. You didn't have to actually include the Python unless you wanted to, uh, because basically I just want to see that you did those. And the problem with um, PyCharm last time was students was having, not knowing how to get it out of PyCharm or where to find it. And even though I, I was trying to create this video showing this on my Windows PC in my office, and the thing is the newer version of PyCharm doesn't have that, um, option that it has in this classroom. I don't know why that, like it has the same thing this one does, only it says um, instead of copy path, it's something like that or copy reference. Yeah, that's what it was. And I downloaded the recent PyCharm and it's not the same one. Now this is the Mac one, so it is a little different, but when you call it up on your desktop, down here, close to the bottom, it has something like um, file path, isn't that what it says, yeah. John? Okay, well, the new version doesn't say file path on the PC. The new version uh, says something like, <laughs> what's that? A pie charm? Yeah, it, but anyway, you, there's another way around that also. You can always say save, and when you click um, or you can, there's a one up here where you can say save as, I think it's right here. Yeah. And then you'll know where, what the path is to where that's being saved and you can even change the path. So even in windows, that's a way to do it. If you're not sure where this is saved at, you can do it that way. I believe I found something up here too on how to find it. But um, this is just because on the test, when you take a test or you do an assignment, if you go ahead and are able to screenshot the run and all of your code, then I can accept that as a screenshot rather than you uploading the actual Python. But if you're having trouble running it or you don't get the right output, if I don't have your Python program, I can't help you 
if you understand what I'm saying, because I only have the screenshot. So that's why I usually tell you to upload both. It helps me uh, to grade it faster if you give me the screenshot where your output is correct and your code is here. So I would take a screenshot of this whole thing and, and upload the Python file, but I don't usually require both. So it's just up to you. If I have the three files, the PDF with your um, pseudocode, and flowchart and then this PDF and then the Python file. And I'll go over this again before test two so that we know that's the ones that's important, but the homework assignments that I give, which I'm gonna, we're gonna go over one of those uh, today that I'm gonna give for next, that's due next Monday also. So in uh, here, that, that was the problem with that. So let me go back and make sure. So hopefully my online students will look at that. Um, okay, that was, this is module two that we're in. So you do that one. This was up here. Um, you should be able to see that. That's the Python answer. If you had problems when you turned in 8B and you didn't understand it, there's an example of the answer. So the unit three test, which we're gonna kind of skim over unit three today, I'm hoping that you already read it because I don't wanna spend time lecturing on the chapter. I would rather spend time doing problems together. So, um, but if you have any questions about it, uh, then we will, we will go over those. This is another one of that guy's tutorials, more on variables, but you're not, this is not actually due. I should have scooted it down here until after all of this, because we haven't really, we, we talked about functions last time and we were gonna do some functions, but I'm actually gonna wait on that. And so this will be your introduction to functions the, the, in Python. So we're gonna do modules in chapter three, which is what we're going over today, which modular programming, remember, is the generic term that's synonymous with functions in Python, right? So in our textbook. So here we're gonna go a little bit over unit three and then we're gonna do, these are the only two mind tap problems that have to do with unit three. And so we're gonna go in and do those in class today. And then if we have time, I'm going to introduce this one. And if we don't, then um, I'll do that on Monday. So any questions about that, what I just covered here in this module? All right, so we're gonna go into unit, unit three then in Cengage or MindTap. So you can click your link there if you want to um, and then go out of the test. I'm just going into, into it this way. Okay, come on. So I'm going to I'm going to go over the chapter a little bit, but I want to be sure that we have time to do both those mind tech problems. And we didn't finish that one on purpose that we were doing in PyCharm. And I will we're going to finish that one a little bit later when we talk more about functions. If you already finished it because you wanted to see how Python works with functions, that's great. That just gives you more practice but we're going to go on to the structure, which is part of modular programming. So that's why th this chapter actually has the basis that I've been talking about, that if you know these three structures and combining those three structures, then you can write any program, you can solve any problem, whether it's an engineering problem, whether it's a um, cyber, troubleshooting problem, whether it's a business related problem like the payroll that we did, payroll problem, those problems can all be solved using a combination of these three structures. And I think I talked a little bit about the spaghetti code in the beginning of the semester, which is 
just not having any kind of structure in your code. And if you go back and read that and you have any questions about what spaghetti code is, let me know. I'm not going over the examples in the chapter. They're very confusing. The way they do the pseudocode and the flowchart in there, we can look at one of them and I'll show you what I'm talking about. To, to me, this is this shows you exactly why spaghetti code is bad. Don't do it and it tells you, and if you can follow this, and not be confused, then uh, you should be teaching <laughs> because this is a very confusing flowchart. And to me, when they show you things like that, it doesn't really help you learn the right way. Um, it's just showing you things that you should not do. But these, you will go back to, you should always remember where the little, little flowchart and pseudocode for these three structures is at sequence, selection, and loop. And sequence is the only type of program that we've been doing up to now, like your test number one, was simply a straight sequential piece of code. It was input, a process step, and output. You couldn't branch anywhere, you couldn't loop anywhere. It was just a sequential run of a program. So you have to understand sequence because in order to do selection, which what's another term that's used for selection? You've been reading about, and I've called it that. Whenever you have a diamond shape in the flow chart, it, it, selection means that you are going to determine which direction to go. I'm gonna select either the yes branch, sometimes it's called branching is what I was trying to get at, Sometimes it's called branching instead of selection, though, or an if then else is a selection statement, okay? So that's what selection means. Loop is, there's a lot of different kinds of loops, but we're going to basically, most of the time, be using a while loop until a couple chapters down, we're gonna do four loops when we get to arrays. So, there are different kinds of loops, but the one we're going to be talking about first that is one of the easier ones to understand, it's a little more coding. But here's what I was talking about to remember where these are located. Sequence means I start at once at the top and I go straight down to the bottom, sequential. And it doesn't have to be a math problem. This was like directions. Go north on First Avenue for three miles, turn left on Washington Boulevard, go west on Washington for two miles, stop at 634 Washington. So there's no decisions to make. You start at the top and you go to the bottom to get to the location 634 Washington. Okay, so the next one is a selection structure, sometimes called a decision structure, and a special kind of decision is called a Boolean expression where it can have, and we did mention this earlier, I remember in the semester, and I told you this was named after a man named Boole. He's the one that came up with this type of, uh, this. it's not code, it was actually algebraic is where he came up with it. So val there is two comparison, there's a comparison, and it can either be true or false. Some programs, programming languages, allow you to do true false, mm -hmm you can set it up to say yes or no. There, it's a state of two switches, they're either on or off. And those of you in engineering, we talked about this before, you, you will have to understand in a circuit that there's groups of switches and there's, they're in um, uh, groups of eight. And one of them's called a, a byte, a word, uh, there, there are groups of eight, 16, 32, um, then they go up to 64, 256. They're, they're like groups of, of uh, eight, and that's how they're set up. But we're not going to be having to work with that. If you want to know about binary and how that works, there is an appendix in Cengage at the end of the book that tells you about exactly how binary math works. So here is an example of a flow chart that has a selection in it. And so up to this point, we haven't used the diamond shape. Somebody did in their test and, I, and it wasn't 
uh, you can't, whenever you get two inputs, that was where a lot of people were having uh, problems were thinking that there was two branches. There's only a way to branch. Like here, this is just showing there's all these sequential steps going on and all of a sudden I have a decision to make. If the decision is yes, I want to do what's in this box. If the decision is no, I want to do what's in this box. But you notice that they all have to meet, both branches has to meet and go back down. That's structured code. You don't want one going off out here and having a chance to go up here and one going down here and never meeting. So here it talks about George Boole. That's the guy that came up with it. He came up with that logic. A flow chart that describes a selection structure begins with the decisions uh, symbol. Now, pseudocode uses an end structure statement. So the important thing when you're doing pseudocode for an if is that you have, you see what's in bold print? It says, if some condition is true, then do this. Now, if you do this, then it means it was true, then you skip the else and jump down to the end if. And so if this statement is not true, then you're going to try the else. So it's only when this statement is false that you'll even see the else portion. So you know, in this case, it has to be one or the other. It can't be both. And if it's this, if it's true, then it can't be false. So if it's true, you jump to the end if. And every programming language and scripting language has something for the end if. End if. Pseudocode is generic and it will always say end if. But like if you're in Java or uh, C++, it's a curly brace. So the if and end if, it's an opening curly brace and an ending curly brace. It doesn't actually have the word end if, but if it doesn't have that closing curly brace, it's gonna keep on thinking that the, that the if statement continues. So here's an example of an if in pseudocode that actually has something in it. It says if traffic, so this is the sum condition. If traffic is backed up on Washington Boulevard, then continue for one block on First Avenue and turn left on Adams Lane. And then you drop down to the end if, right? But if traffic is not backed up, then you would do the else portion, turn left on Washington Boulevard and then end if. Now, this if then else, even if you're in engineering, I've had weather students here in class before too, and if you've used an Excel spreadsheet, you put formulas in, well, they use if then else's. So um, even Excel spreadsheets in their formulas, you need to understand what an if then else does. So um, here, similarly, a payroll program might include a state statement such as, if hours worked is more than 40, then calculate regular pay and overtime pay. Else, calculate reg regular pay. So when uh, your program asks the user to input the total hours worked, if it's over 40, then it's gonna jump automatically. I'm, I'm sorry, if it's over 40, it's gonna go here. If it's, un, if it's 40 or less, it's gonna go to the else section and then end if. Now these if else's that we just looked at, these branching or selection statements are called dual alternative. Why do you think they're called dual? What does the word dual mean? Two. Correct. There's two different things you can do. There's, if it's true, you're going to do this. If it's false, you're going to do this. There are times when there is not a dual alternative. There's a do nothing branch. So when there's a do nothing branch, then you don't have to put an else in there. You would simply say, if it is raining, then take an umbrella, end if. If employee participates in the dental plan, then deduct $40 from the employee gross pay. 
That's called a single alternative where one of the branches is a null or there's nothing to do there. And here's how that flowchart would look. You would still have the no branch on the flowchart, but you don't do anything. So they just connect down here and do whatever's below. Okay, so then we have the loop structure, which is sometimes referred to as repetition or iteration, which means that you're going to keep doing something. You're, it's kind of a combination of a selection and a loop, because here you notice the no branch is down at the bottom on the diamond shape. But when it's just an if else, that's how you can tell right away because the nose is going to be over here and they're going to join. But when it's a loop, it's still got a test at the top if I want to keep looping or not. Because if I don't want to keep looping, if this condition is no longer true, then I'll drop out of the loop. Otherwise, I want to do this again. And at the bottom of this, I have to always be changing whatever the test is or I'll be in an infinite loop. So the while loop tests a condition before executing the loop body even once. And we did talk about this in uh, chapter two because I was talking about end of file and we had to give a value, that program that we were writing in PyCharm, we had to give a value to name. First, we had to ask, okay, did you input a name? If name is not equal to quit, right? Then we kept looping and doing something here. And at the bottom of this detail loop, it asks again for input. Because if it doesn't, then you're going to be in an infinite loop. Some programmers call a while loop a while do loop because it fits the following statements. While test condition continues to be true, do some process until the condition is no longer true, then you'll drop to the end while. So when you provide directions to your house, which is at street address 634, part of the directions might be, while the address of the house you are passing remains below 634, travel forward to the next house. Look at the address on the house. So that's where, where you're uh, changing the condition again, is right here. And so you say, look at the address on the house, and if it's still below 634, then travel forward to the next house. As soon as the address on the house is 634, you would drop out to the end while. See how a loop ends? So you've got to be able to, to do that at the end. You encounter examples of looping every day as in each of the following. <laughs> we do this all the time. While you continue to be hungry, take another bite of food. Determine whether you still feel hungry. If you do, then continue in the loop. That's how simple a loop is. We think of it as all numbers and logic, but everything you do every day you don't realize our logical um, uh, patterns that you follow. You just do them without thinking about it. Well, with logic and with a computer, you have to tell it every single thing that you want it to do, and you have to test, am I still in that state? So here it says, while unread pages remain in the reading assignment, read another unread page. Determine whether there are more pages to read. If there are, then continue in the loop when you're done in the while. So, and these are combining structures and that's a very good little video. When I, I'm just not, you know, done, there's no purpose to play it in class, but you guys should watch those if this is your first uh, introduction to loops or structures. So all logic problems can be solved with only these three structures. Combining them are sometimes referred to as stacking the structures. So here's a simple example. Step A and step B from top to here are sequence. You just do one step after the other. Then there's a branch here. There's an if else that says if condition C is true, do what's in step D. 
else do what's in step E. So this is a, what kind of a, a if else? Is it dual or single? Dual. Then we'll drop out of that one and our loop says condition F, if it's true, do step G and continue to do step G until condition, condition F is no longer true, then drop out. So that's the use of all three structures in one pseudocoder flowchart. That's a flowchart. So we can also do something called nesting structures. That's usually what confuse is a little more confusing. So what's nested inside this if else? What kind of structure? Sequence, selection, or loop? Sequence. So in the yes side of the if else, there's a sequential structure. There's nothing over here. So if it's false, you're gonna do nothing. So what kind of a, seat of a selection is this? Single, very good. So in the pseudocode for the logic, the indentation shows that all three steps must execute if condition H is true. These three statements constitute a block. So now they took what was step in and nested a loop. Look at what the pseudocode looks like. It says, if condition H is true, then I'm gonna start the sequential steps but inside the sequential steps, I nested a while loop. And the while loop says, continue until condition M is no longer true, then I'll execute step L, which is part of my sequence, and then I'll end if. So here's another one. Yeah, <laughs> this is another one that's nested. So this portion is nested inside what? What's that? That's the beginning of a while loop, right? It says while condition M is true, then I'm gonna do this if statement that's nested inside the while. It's on which branch of the while? It's on the true side, right? It's in the loop. So it starts out and it says, if condition O is true, then do step P. If condition uh, O is false, do step Q. And look where this line comes. It comes back up to test the while loop again. So you're gonna keep doing this if statement as part of the detail until condition M is no longer true, and then it'll do step L and drop out. Yes? That seems rather redundant. Well, it's not redundant because it's asking something different. See, this one is saying condition O. This is saying if condition M is true, which is the condition for the loop. But they both lead back to the same. Thing. Yes, they have to because, uh, because until this is no longer true, but you're, instead of redundant, I think what you're trying to say, it's an infinite loop because I don't see, you don't, you don't see anywhere. And so it's gotta be somewhere here that they're doing something to change condition M, right? right. Or else it's gonna keep doing this forever, right? Like, what I'm, like I'm saying is like, why have condition O in the first place if it's gonna be like that? Yeah, it, you're right. There needs, it's not, it's just not showing the deep. Yeah. Okay, because up here in the, we're going to do it with real numbers and then it'll make more sense. But right here, what Chase is saying, okay, why have this if? Because there's no way to get to the end while, seemingly, right? They don't tell you how they're going to change condition M to be false. Do you see something, Zach? Do you see, do you see what he's... So that is why it seems redundant. But here is it, here it is with some actual something that you're doing, the process of buying and planting flowers in the spring. If we are planting flowers this year, then 
buy flowers in pots. Are we planting flowers this year is the very first question. If the answer is yes, then you buy flowers in pots and then you say, is frost still possible? Yes. Is it over 50 degrees today? And if the answer is yes, bring potted flowers outdoors for the day and check again, is frost still possible? See? So, like, why ask the question again? Well, they didn't, yeah, because they never did tell, they never did change it, did they? So actually where it's going to be better, this is what I want you to always remember where this is, because any combination of these three, now, you know, I told you after step test one, you would not be required to do flowchart and pseudocode. So whichever makes better sense to you, this should show an example of the pseudocode, but th this is an example with flowchart what, how you do sequence, how you do selection, how you do loops. And they're open-ended, so that means you can stack them. There's different ways to put them together. Uh, the, but the thing is, imagine physically picking up any of the three structures using the entry and exit handles. These are the spots at which you could connect one structure to another. Similarly, any complete structure from its entry point to its exit point can be inserted within the process symbol of any other structure forming nested structures. So here's the summary of what went on so far. And then they tell you, watch that video on understanding structure. And so she will explain it. Let me go back up there. Where's that at? Is that at the top of here? Where we were at. Yeah. Okay. I think in this case, I am going to play this and see because of Chase's questions. I want to see how she explains it here. Hi, this is Joyce Farrell. Let's talk about structure. Structured programming has three structures. With a sequence structure, you enter the structure and then you perform one step after the other for as many steps as it takes to accomplish a problem and then you exit the structure. The second structure is a selection structure. When you enter a selection, you ask a question. If the answer is yes, you travel one logical path of the selection. Or when you enter the selection structure and ask the question, if the answer is no, you travel the other logical path of the structure. Either way, you exit the structure when you're done. The third structure is a loop. When you enter a loop, you ask a question. If the answer is yes, you execute the loop body and ask the question again. If the answer is still yes, you execute the loop body again and ask the question again. When the answer to the question is finally no, you exit the loop structure. The sequence structure has a single entry and exit point. The selection structure has a single entry and exit point. And the loop structure has a single entry and exit point. You can combine structures in two ways. You can use the entry and exit points to stack them end to end to attach them to each other. You can also nest structures by placing any structure entirely the inside one another question. one using those entry and exit points. For example, you might have a sequence and you might stack it on top of a loop. So you'd have a sequence followed by a loop. You might have a sequence followed by a selection. You might have a loop followed by a selection, or you might have any other combination of structures stacked end to end. When you nest structures, you might have a selection, you might have a sequence, and you can take the sequence and nest it inside one half of the selection. You might have a loop and a selection, and you might nest the selection entirely inside the loop. The three structures, sequence, selection, and loop, can be stacked and nested and combined in an infinite number of ways, but the three of them alone can be used to solve every programming problem. Okay, so she Thanks doesn't she doesn't actually 
uh, define what what's happening, Chase. Is you're going ahead and putting values in, and we're gonna we're gonna get to that. We're gonna like a logical sense. Yeah. And so what they're showing you is what the possibilities are without the details in there. That you can nest them like that, but you don't. It, here's what we're going to talk about here in just a minute: is the priming input, which is very important to a while loop. So once um, right here, priming input, and this is going to take care of what you were talking about with the loop, where it looked like you would be in there indefinitely. Now you remember this famous problem that we've done since the beginning: the number doubling program. Remember, you take a number and double it. So the declarations are here, just remember with any language except for Python. And so a lot of times in our mind tap, they go ahead and make these declarations. And so they're just saying, uh, original number is going to be numeric. So that means in Python, we got to change our input to integer, right? Um, calculated answer is the other variable. So these are the two variables that are going to be used in the problem. So they're in a declaration rectangle. Then it says input original number. Here's something where it says do not do this. This logic is not structured. So you don't want to put the no out here and stop because the two branches have not come together anywhere. So here is the beginning of a number doubling flowchart. And then here is where we want to know, are you done? And this is not, this is testing the condition, but it's got it backwards. So let me show you where they start it right. Don't, um, why do they keep showing don't do it? I don't want to see the don't do it. There we go. Okay. So here's a functional structured flowchart for the number doubling program. You have your declarations, you have your priming input. Why is this called priming? What do you do? You guys are too, too young to remember how when you used to have to pump a, a car foot feet to get the gas primed up into the tank. <laughs> now you don't have to do that. But when you used to have uh, stick shift cars and it was cold out, You'd have to hit the foot feet several times and it's called priming the, the feet. And so that's what this does. It puts something in it before there's any test done. And if you don't have this and you come to the test and you haven't asked what is a number that you want to test to see if you're finished, then it won't know, it won't uh, have any, any way of getting out of the loop. So here it says, this is the proper way to do the loop. If you're not at end of file, we did talk about this the other day. End of file simply means if I don't have a number in here, then I'm going to stop. But down here, you'll notice at the bottom of my loop, this step gets all subsequent inputs because I don't come back up here to get the input every time. So I have to put an input in there, say, okay, am I done? Do I want to, do I want to double any more numbers? That's what that, that says. And if there's a number in there, I go in, I calculate my answer, output my answer. And then I say, do you want to double another number? If you, if you put another number in there, then it's going to come back up here and say, Am I at the end of file? No, I have a new number. So I want to calculate another one. When I'm done, I would put quit or EOF. And if I didn't want to do another number and it'd come back up here and it'd say, do I have another new number? No. So I'm going to stop. So that's what every loop has to have. A priming, if it's a while loop. Okay, we're going to do four loops way on down. You don't do that but there's a priming input and there has to be another way to um, change the value or else it'll keep doing that one number. If I didn't have this down here, it's gonna stay in here with say I put five in there. It's gonna keep printing out 10 and then I'll say, do you have, still have a number? Yeah, I still have a number in there and it's just gonna stay in that loop if I take that out. Everybody follow? 
we're going to do it. You'll see what happens. So um, that's why when we were doing that structured in chapter two and it said um, housekeeping and they did their priming input in the housekeeping. So some of this is, there's a lot. Understanding the reasons for structure, and these are things that are in the test for clarity, for professionalism, for efficiency, and it talks about those old languages that I learned, COBOL and RPG were developed before the principles of structured programming were discovered. However, even programs that use those older languages can be written in a structured form because by the time I started taking my, uh, in the, in the um, early 80s, I started taking my classes in COBOL, there was a way to structure and we were taught that way. And it's called go to list programming <laughs> was how it first became about because you don't want any go to's where it doesn't end right. And then it gives you some other reasons that it's important. So recognizing structure, they have you do that. There's a bunch of exercises here that I don't, I don't go through. So, but if you're having problems recognizing the difference, then you need to go through those. And yeah, that's one of those confusing ones. This was one, this one is similar to the one we have in MindTap. Look at the pseudocode. If you see what the pseudocode looks like, I didn't get big for me, I don't know why. But you can kind of see, this was like washing a dog is the routine they used. So they said, catch the dog, does the dog run away? Yes, then catch the dog again. And go what, did the dog run away? No, then turn on the water, does the dog run away? Yes, then turn off the water, catch the dog. You see all the nested ifs and all that? <laughs> so that is an example of using nested structures over and over. Um, and here is where they modularized it. You remember we learned about this shape? Um, the shape with the uh, horizontal bar across the top and in lucid chart we'll be doing it with the bars on the side so this is a function and we're before you learn how to do a function in Python you can go and do that little exercise called functions in there where that uh, guy does the tutorial for you but this is a flow chart using functions so it makes the code a little simpler to have catch the dog and start the water as a separate routine. And that's what they're doing here. You notice they have the separate module down here. So that's what this part is about. Okay, so we're gonna go over, then that's the end of the chapter. So we're gonna go over and we're gonna do the first problem in, um, in MindTap. So, now remember, Monday, I know we'll have class again, so I can remind you again, but I always put, so that it's consistent and isn't confusing, I went ahead and put midnight on Monday night for this being due, the unit test, unit three test. But um, you should have already read it and taken it at least by Monday, even if you haven't by today. And then, um, but I, I know some semesters I'll go in and put the due date before this class time and then students get so confused. So every assignment I try to make it due on the Monday night so that you don't get confused. And then that way I don't have any excuse for reopening those. All right, so we're gonna go into, let me go out of this. Um, yeah, I don't want that one. Okay, so we're gonna go into the code and using flowcharts and pseudocode in Python, your link is inside uh, Canvas, right? So you click on it and there's not much you have to do in this particular one because they're wanting to show you a good example of pseudocode is what this first one is about. It doesn't actually have the flowchart, it only has the pseudocode. But it tells you here in this lab, 
And if you don't want to do it with me, then if you get stuck, you'll at home, you, you know, you might not be able to get 100%. So in this lab, who's done it already? Okay, did you guys have any trouble with it? No, okay. This one, you only have to actually do three lines of code or two, I can't remember for sure. Um, it's partially created Python program is over here. But what's important is to look at the whole problem is actually solved with the pseudocode. So you could do this pseudocode in any language. Now, if you look at this statement as compared to the pseudocode, what do you see that's different? In this line of code, if test score is greater than or equal to 90, then that's pseudocode. This is Python. If test score is greater than or equal to 90, colon. So the colon in Python is the syntax. So what I have a lot of students do because they get confused, they write their, their Python up and then they copy it as their pseudocode on the test or on problems, okay? That is, the, the difference is that this Python is not generic for any language, but it's so close, <laughs> scripting is. But this pseudocode is when you look at the problem and you determine how to answer, how to solve it, but you don't necessarily, like these parentheses, they're not in here. And, and the word print is output over here, right? But I did tell you that in your pseudocode, you could say print instead of output because we're using Python. And that's what most students end up doing. Their pseudocode matches whatever language they're coding in. So I forget in here, is there anybody in here that's a programming major? Just programming? Okay, Zach. So you, you, this is important because you'll take languages like Java and C++. So you need to know the generic way of solving it. But also, a lot of students, if they know Python script, that kind of becomes their pseudocode, you know. So, because if you can get it to run in Python script, then you know you've got the logic right. And then solving it in Java or C++ is a little more challenging because of the syntax that's required, okay? So, does anybody have any questions about how it's taken this over to here? Anybody have any questions? Okay, so this is all done for you. So the only thing you have to do is this part right here. Input test score and class rank. So up here, it says get input and convert to correct data type for test score and class rank. So what kind of data does test score and class rank need to be? What do they come in as when you do your input statement? So it's gonna say, as what? They come in as a string, right. And you have to change it to an integer. So you go test score equals integer parentheses input. And then you say, uh, what did it want us to say? Please enter a test score and then does it have a colon after it i think it's pretty picky let me see here let me find it make sure i get it right it may it may be not as where did that go um, now i lost oh there it is Okay, I changed where I had everything. Okay, so these, um, tests, oh, they did it, they, they did, um, did it make you do this when you, in Python 2 statements, or in MindTap? No, okay. See, they did the conversion as a separate variable, so they said, input inner students test score did they make you say it like that no okay good it's going to be a little uh more forgiving this time okay space enter please enter a test score and then the next one is class rank 
equals uh, integer input um, please enter a class rank okay so now let's see if it runs that should be all that you have to put in because they've done all the rest of the python program and these are ifs and nested ifs. You see that? It says if test score is greater than or equal to 90, and if class rank is greater than or equal to 25, then accept that student. Else, print reject. Then it says else. So if it's come up here and it's, and it's not, it drops out at this very first if, it's going to drop to this nested if. So if it's not 90, it's never going to get to this one, right? And so here it's going to say if it's 80 and the class rank is 50, then accept and, and if not, print reject. So it's only going to print reject on the second nested ifs here. So down to 70. So if it's not a 90, 80, or 70, then it's automatically going to print reject, right? So what does it tell us to run with first? Uh, tells us to run the button at the bottom, entering an 87 for test score and 60 for the class rank. So I'm gonna run it, enter an 87, and enter a 60. Oh, did it in? Yeah. And it said accept, which should be correct. Now run the program again and use a 60 for the test score. So if I use a 60 for the test score, what should I get? Reject. So it's not even going to go into any of the nested ranks. Doesn't care about this rank because if you don't have at least a um, 60 test score, then it's going to reject you anyway. Please enter a rank, 87, reject. So it worked. So now over here, you should be able to say, run the checks and submit, right? All you have to add to this is input. Right, right. Which one? Right, oh, where the input statements are? Yeah, that's all you have to add. And let me see. Let me see if I can pull them out. There you go. So this is what your input statement should have looked like. Now, they did, you could also do them in two statements. You could ask for the input, and it comes in as a string. And then you could convert it to integer. But it's a lot more efficient coding to do it this way, right? I, I think I messed up my thing because for some reason, all the text is green now. All the text. Oh, you probably have left the quote off. If you leave a quote off or a parenthesis, uh, yeah. Oh, you put it. Where'd you put your input? Well, you, but I hit a backspace on this keyboard. So it's oh, dude, I'll try it. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, Yeah, but it won't have to be done. That's fine. Okay, yeah, you can just close it out. It's going to get it. I missed the making of it. Oh, I think you took the comments off. That should be good. See, this, I don't know. That's the comment. Oh, all she did was up here where this 
you know, we were trying to figure out multi-line comment last time. It's three double quotes at the beginning and the end, uh, or one single line quote or comment is with a hashtag. So if like this whole, all these green lines of code are multi-line comment with three double quotes. And then the hashtag is if you just want to do a single line quote for the comment. Okay. Okay, so this one, oh. Oh, is yours not working anymore? I'm pretty sure all I did was, I think I'm almost there. I just went up to the school board with everything there. Oh, inner, uh, what it says over here, 87 first. <laughs> Don't even put a colon, colon first. No, no, because the colon should have been in here. Okay. But it might do okay now, hit enter. See, anything that you put in the double quotes is going to print exactly like that to the screen. Okay. And anything outside the quotes, see, that leaves you room then to enter the input. So now try 60 and it will see if it'll give you back with that. Go ahead, run it in. Uh, don't hit enter. It's already running. See, it says okay. it's set. Okay. So now you run it again and you, you, you just flip the values and it's going to get rejected. So now, you put 60 in first, and then reject. Okay. So now you go over to your checks and see if it'll give you Okay, thank you. All right, so this one, um, I want to, you know, we didn't have any constants in here, and I, I think the next one we do. Okay, so the next one is called writing a modular program in Python. So in this lab, you're going to add the input and output statements to a partially completed Python program. When completed, the user should be able to enter a year, a month, and a day. The program then determines if the date is valid. Valid years are those that are greater than zero. Valid months include the values one through 12 and valid days include the values one through 31. Okay, now what are these called, these variables right here? What kind of variables are those? Constant. And you know that, know that right away because they're all caps and also they have a value. So it's saying minimum year. So these rules that it just gave you right here, they've defined with constants, right? So they say the minimum year is zero. And, and this is a Boolean variable because they're setting it up to true and if it's false, then it will be an invalid date, right? So it's, it can test valid date by saying if valid date, then do something. So these are my constants. These are my variables that I'm gonna have to ask for input. So here it says year equals done, month equals done, day equals done. These are declarations of these variables, okay? It's simply saying, this is what they, these are the three variables that you need to ask for. Right here it says get the month, then the day, then the year. And they have this as housekeeping here, but we don't actually do anything with it. It's just showing you so that it correlates with what you were taught in the chapter. Remember we talked about report headings and things like that. And that's kind of old style programming. That's why we're not, I'm not gonna, uh, require that you do a housekeeping function in your problem because that was used more in procedural programming than it is in object programming, which is the languages that y'all are going to be using. But it's saying if you were, this is why this is a comment. It's saying this is the housekeeping portion. Okay, so here's where we're going to put our input. So we don't want to comment there. We want to put what our input is. So I'm gonna I'm gonna cheat a little bit. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. No, no, no. Um, okay. Boy, why didn't I open that? Um, let's see. 
Okay, so here is where I want to go to um, this one. So I'm gonna copy my input. So now my input, just because I'm lazy at typing. So here's what needs to be there. Year equals input, enter year. You'll notice I have single quotes there, double quotes work too. Um, month equals input, enter month. Day equals input, enter day. Now, like, it's Ty, right? Yes, ma'am. Uh, okay, so what he was asking, like when he ran his program, it didn't have the colon, so he was gonna type the colon. Well, you can't do that when you're actually putting your value there. So if you want a colon to show up in your output, you need to put it here between the quotes, and then there's a space so that your uh, input value is not right up against what, what's printing there. That's how you get it to look a little better. So it's saying a, a good housekeeping routine would be to check if the information is valid before you try to process it. And that's what it's doing there. So then, here I'll leave those right there so you can see. So then check to be sure if the date is valid and you already have this. It says if integer year, now why did they have to put int year here? It's, it wants it in a number form. And up here, when we asked for the input, we didn't turn it into an integer, right? It will not do a comparison if less than or equal to minimum year, because minimum year, uh, where's it at? Up here is minimum year is set to zero. So it will, and that is an integer but we made year a string. So if you don't put integer there, it won't do a comparison. And you'll notice they put a comment out here that says it's an invalid year, valid date equals false. So it's saying if integer year is less than or equal to minimum year. So say I type in a, if it's a zero, it's not gonna take it, right? If I type in, type in, if it's less than or equal to minimum year, then it's going to say it's, it's invalid. It's, this is what it's gonna change valid date to false. So down here in the end of job portion, it says if valid date is the same as true, I've gotta put an output statement, right? So if it's still true that it is valid, Oops, I didn't do that right. I guess. Let me see. Well, it hasn't finished yet. We haven't finished it. We got to do our output. Okay. Now our output statement will say, this has got a lot of coding in it. Let me move it over so you can see it. That's what it looks like. And else, if it's not, if it's false, we want to say something else. We want to say invalid date, right? I'm going to copy it, sorry, and then I'll put it over there and you'll see. So the only difference in this output statement and the previous one is that this one says invalid date. So if valid date is still true, because look up at the top, we set valid date is true, right? So it's initialized to true. And so if it doesn't fall in one of these if statements and set it to false, it's going to print validate when it gets down there. So we're gonna try it here in a minute. I'll let y'all get it typed in. Now these slashes, you see what it's doing? It's a string. So it's saying print month plus a slash plus a day plus a slash plus a year. So it's going to print out whatever date you entered. And it's going to say that date is a valid date. If it doesn't fall in the valid, then it's going to print that same date that you entered, but it's going to say is an invalid date. So that's all this is doing. It's testing for whether the date is valid or not. So it's using a selection statement 
we, we haven't even used a loop or anything in this one. Yeah, we're just going to enter whatever the, the input is. Y'all see it? You can actually, if you get this statement right, you can just copy and paste it down here and just change the word valid to invalid. <laughs> the first half of it's identical. This portion up to there is identical. So you can copy it down to the second one and just change the word valid to invalid. Why, why are these words not in quotes? Month. Variables. You want to actually print what is in sitting in month and what's sitting inside day. You don't want to print the words month, day, and year. You want to print the value of those variables, right? Everybody got it? No. no? Okay. Y'all are slow as I am on typing. I used to I used to tell everybody, okay, I'm a programmer and I only have to type as fast as I can think. So if you don't think real fast, you have to be a fast typer. I never did take typing before I became a programmer. You didn't have to back then. Um, What's that? Oh, are you trying to run it? Well, we haven't had to run it. Well, yeah, but still. Where's your saying? It's unexpected by line. Line. Oh, well. I get saying right here. Oh, that's because that needs to be a way to. I got it. No, just write exactly on the end of that. No. Oh. But it's in the right So there? there. Yeah, I, I just checked it while we were doing that. That was just saying. Yeah, there we go. Okay. That's all it was. Python's real picky about the indents. All Chase's was is he had this print statement indented over under the word output. Python's real picky about that. You gotta have it right in the right place. You get it, Caitlin? Did we do number 22? Or 23, I'm sorry, or 17? What now? 22 and 17. On the code part. A line number? Oh, no, there's nothing goes there. Uh, there's nothing goes there. Is that what you're saying? 23. No, that's just got a comment there. Does yours not have a comment there? Okay. Now, you, oh, I see what you're saying. Do you type anything under there? No. This is saying, this is a comment to the user saying, this code right here is going to check to be sure the date is valid. Now, um, I'm hoping you got that running. It has you do it this way with this because I need to go over and show you what the head first program is that you can start on. That will really show. You get it? Okay, we'll look at these. If yours isn't running, we'll look at them. I, I'll go by after. I want to show everybody what is in. If you go back to Canvas, this program that I was telling you to do in Module 2, the Head First Chapter 1, we I did show you at one time where that is, but it's the free PDF is right here. It says use the head first PDF to complete this assignment. Read from page one to 25. That may sound like a lot of pages, but if you haven't looked at that book, it's all pictures. So it says, or in the PDF, it's page 61. So if I look at it and you can download this whole PDF or you can open it up in preview whichever way, let me, I'm going to open mine up so it'll open up. Fundamentals. Da, da, da. Okay, so this is what it looks like. 
And so it says to start on page one and go to page 61. So at, on page 61, now it usually lets me do that. Oh, there it is. Go to page 61. And I'll show you what you do. As you go along in this, in this chapter, you're building a guessing game in Python, okay? And so it shows you the answers for the code, but it uses an if else. That's all it's gonna use in this first part is an if else that we learned in, in, in this chapter. So when you code it, now in this book, they only use idle, but it's, you can use PyCharm, whichever you're more comfortable with. When you run it, you should get this. Every time you run it, it tells you what you get. If there's no loop, so this is the code that you'll do. So you should have that and you will submit it in that submit assignment. Well, I, I said, I'll look at that after. I want you to watch this so you'll know how to do this assignment. And then I'll look at everybody's after. So this one is the, is the assignment that's in uh, module two. So we did, you were supposed to have already done this one more on variables. You're supposed to do the test. And we did these two in class. And then you need to do this one because we're gonna go over um, over it in, in class, but I'm not gonna spend much time on it. I'm just gonna ask questions if you had any problems with it. So I, cause I wanna see what you can do. So I'm probably not gonna go over the answer here, but I, so I want you to do this one, which just has an if else in it. And I want you to code it in Python like it does in that head first <coughs> book. <laughs> and you'll notice this isn't due till the next week. <laughs> oh, okay. Any questions except for you? I'll go over and look at Lainey's. Did anybody else have trouble with that mind tap one that they need help with? That second mind tap one? Okay. See you guys on Monday. Let me stop this recording.